Hey there, I'm here at Hillsdale College today with Tony Swinehart, or Dr. Tony Swinehart, right? We gotta get your credentials out here. He's, uh, you can tell he's important because he's wearing a lab coat. Uh, so he's a professor here, and uh, you're a biology professor? That's correct. And we're gonna talk about fossils today. So why should I trust you over a paleontologist or a geologist? Are, are you well, I'm qualified? Not, I, I don't know. I'm not <laughs> sure you should. I know enough to be dangerous. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I, I grew up uh, fascinated by fossils and prehistoric life, but I grew up in northern Indiana where pretty much everything is glacial till and outwash and all the fossils are rounded off. But it was enough to keep me interested, but I ended up uh, pursuing a, a aquatic biology, freshwater and marine biology, but I always retained an interest in fossils. And now that I'm a pl at a place like Hillsdale College where, you know, I don't have to specialize so much as you would at a big major research university, uh, I can branch out and do research not only in aquatic biology, but in paleontology as well. So I've published a couple papers on paleontology, but I'm not like, you know, one of the world's experts, that's for sure. I uh, know just enough to be dangerous, so. But when you think about it, when I think about it, um, all the stuff up in, in, in our area, up in Alpena, um, it's all aquatic, so Absolutely. it's just old. So being a biology professor might be more important uh, than a geologist, for example. True, it's, you know, the, the disciplines are uh, equally appropriate. You know, you need to be a little bit of a biologist and a little bit of a geologist to do paleontology. And like I say, I've got some oceanfront property in Michigan and Ohio, it's just 360 million year old right. oceanfront property. So. So while we're in this room, uh, this is the, tell us about this. This is a museum that you've, you've created? So uh, this is called the Daniel M. Fisk Museum of Natural History. Uh, we used to have here at Hillsdale, back starting in 1874 until about the 1960s, a very large, impressive natural history museum. And in the 60s, it kind of fell by the wayside due to space needs and things got thrown out and so on. So I came to the college in 1998 I decided to make as one of my goals rebuilding the museum and may not be bigger than it was in the past, but the goal is to make it better than it was in the past. And I think we're already getting there and surpassing that. So uh, it is open to the public. Uh, you should you know, check in at the uh, hotel if you wanna come visit the Hillsdale College Dow Conference Center Hotel. Uh, it's open from uh, about 7.30 a.m. to 3.45 p.m. Uh, regular school days, so Monday through Friday, but not in the summer or weekends and things like that, unfortunately. We just don't have enough uh, staff to do that. And these dinosaurs behind me, are these replicas or are these real? These are actually uh, mostly real bone. So my students and I and some colleagues uh, from the University of North Georgia collected these out west in the Dakotas and, uh, and uh, had the expedition funded by a uh, one of them was funded by a former student of mine that took my historical geology class. And these are mostly real bones. Some of the bones are cast where we had missing bone, but most of the specimens are real bone, which is kind of unusual to see in, on public display two real bone dinosaurs in Michigan. Yeah. Is this a triceratops? Right, it's very good, triceratops. And that's a hadrosaur called Edmontosaurus annectens, a type of duckbill dinosaur. All right, I didn't know that one, but I was pretty sure I knew this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one's hard enough to get. It. All right, well, let's go to your lab, and uh, we're going to talk about prepping fossils. You're going to talk about prepping fossils. I'm going to ask questions if, if need be, and we'll go there Sounds now. Sounds like fun. I'm honored to be on the channel. I'm a subscriber and love Michigan Rock, so this is kind of cool. And, and I'm honored to be here with people who actually know things about rocks, <laughs> so that's that's fun for me, too. So everybody's having fun. Everybody's Hopefully having you're having fun, fun too. <laughs> All right. So this is Tony's lab. Looks like a place where stuff happens. And he's over here at the microscope and he's gonna show us how to prep a fossil. So we're gonna learn a little bit about fossil preparation. You know, a lot of people may think when they go to a museum and they see dinosaurs uh, assembled in three dimensions and so on that you just sort of take a shovel and dig them out of the ground. Or if you see these beautiful trilobites with delicate spines and that kind of thing that you just find them way that way. Well, uh, even in Jurassic Park, when they're digging up the, the raptors, you know, in the beginning, they look like they're all perfectly laid out and all you have to do is brush the dirt off. Well, that couldn't be anything, you know, any further from the truth. 
there's usually what's called prep involved or preparation, removing the specimens from rock or what we call matrix. And uh, it, it can be quite tedious and time consuming. You know, a dinosaur skeleton, you could be talking about thousands of hours of somebody who's hired to do just prep, to get the rock off, to, to sometimes you have to chemically consolidate the fossil so it doesn't just turn to dust. And so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, prep. The simplest kind of prep that you can do, especially if you find a fossil on a beach, you may not need to do anything with it. You may not need to remove matrix. Maybe you've got an exposed horn coral or exposed brachiopod. Simplest thing you may want to do to prep it is just to use a toothbrush and scrub off the algae and the dirt. Um, that's, I guess, a form of prep. I find that my wife's toothbrush works better than mine for that. Oh, isn't that great? Especially <laughs> when she doesn't know. You know, you kind of wear it in for her. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a nice really thing to... Her out. Yeah, so it doesn't wear down her teeth so much. But uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the I guess the next simplest thing with regard to fossil prep would to be used a, a pin vise. So this is a hand tool. You can get these at hardware stores and so on. I don't know what other people use them for, but I use them for prep. And it's kind of hard to get hypodermic needles. They're the best because they're hardened steel. But I imagine it's kind of hard to acquire those for various reasons. Uh, I've used, uh, you, can, you can buy on, online uh, the pins that people use for tattooing and so on. They're not as hard, but they can work. Uh, but uh, sometimes you may have, such as a trilobite, the, uh, I think, Rob, did you find this or was it Sam? Sam found that. Sam found a trilobite that's embedded in rock. And this is an enrolled trilobite. So you've got the uh, underside or the abdomen curled around up to the head. So it's basically like rolled up like a pill bug. And it's largely encased in rock. So at first we would use mechanical prep, which I'll show you. But then we've got to get all of this rock out from in between the segments and so on and so forth. So that would involve, and this is, even though it's limestone, it is soft enough that, uh, that you can use a small tool like this to remove it and, and hopefully not damage or scratch the fossil. So it's best to do this under a dissecting microscope. Um, for you younger folks where your eyes are still good and healthy, you may get by without it. But it's a relatively tedious process. But you can see that even though this is limestone, it is soft enough that with this pin vise, I can scrape it off, blow off the... And so we'll just expose this little portion of this segment right here. You can see this segment goes underneath the rock. And now, now you can start to see the segment become exposed as I remove... You know, it's not going to look as dark as the rest of the segment because it's, it's got powder of limestone on it. But if I were to put water on that, you would just see this with one continuous black piece of the segment. And so you just have to get under here for hours and scrape away that matrix. Now, if you really don't want to scratch the fossil, which is ideal, you'd rather not even touch the fossil. When we get this down either with a pin vise or a, a mechanical tool, which we'll be talking about. You can get it just to where it's close to the fossil, and then you can use, it's kind of like a sand blaster, but it's not as harsh as sand. You use a medium that's harder than the rock, but softer than the fossil. You can kind of scrape down to where you're close to the fossil, and then you can use this sand blasting device, or a media blaster, what we call it, and blast that away so that you're not actually touching and scratching the fossil. Uh, just depends on how soft your fossil is and so on. Now I have, go ahead. Could you show that little that little bulb you've got there to blow? Oh yeah, so like a neat little tool. This is handy, you know, sometimes I get lazy and I just blow with my mouth like that, but this little, uh, this is an aspirator and so it just, it just makes air and so if I scrape off a a bunch of material there and it's starting to get into my way, I can have this in the other hand and just blow that away. This is the other side of that same trilobite after Tony worked on it for several hours. So this is not a Michigan fossil. This is a fossil fish from K2 
Kemmerer, Wyoming, southwest Wyoming, from the Eocene age, so about 50 million year old, uh, Green River Formation. So this was a freshwater lake, and the matrix is really soft. And these fish, and I won't get into the details of how, but I've done a lot of research on how they were and why they were preserved so exquisitely. But even the scales are articulated just as they were on the fish. So this brown here over the ribs and so on, those are actual scales. And so those are extremely delicate. This is way too delicate in my mind to be using a, a media blaster or anything like this. This is ideal for hand prep. In many cases, as you remove the rock, you're going to want to consolidate it with a liquid polymer that when it dries, it'll, it'll keep those scales and things from popping off. But this one, you're just using a very, very sharp needle and kind of poking into the matrix. And hopefully you can see how that matrix pops away from the fossil. I've got half of this fish exposed in this manner. And already, I would there's the little pieces that are kind of flaking. I would be wanting to get in there with a tiny paintbrush and adding this this material that we call a consolidant. But you can imagine how many hours of work. So when you go and you see a fossil like this, and, and it's for sale for 125 or 200 or whatever it is, you know, part of the what you're paying for is the hours and hours of work that goes into prepping these things and getting them exposed from the rock. And of course, the, some of the museum quality exquisite specimens you see in major museums, you're talking about thousands of hours for a particular specimen. See that? And then you have to get, you know, all this material out of the vertebrae and that kind of thing too to get a really nice prep. That's going to be really cool looking. It already is really cool looking. Yeah, that one. How many cool. hours would you say you have into that? Uh, maybe ten. 15. Okay. This one's, uh, I believe this one's going to end up being a, a fish that has two dorsal fins, a spiny dorsal fin and a soft a dorsal fin called uh, uh, myoplosis labricoides. Sometimes you need to have a little bit more aggressive methods. Uh, this one was an example. This is actually an armored fish called a placoderm. This is uh, Bothriolepis canadensis. And when I received this one, this one was collected back in the 60s. This was an entirely covered with rock. The only place it was exposed was this light area here where you can see it's been kind of weathered in here. The entire rest of this thing was in rock. And of course, uh, I'm going to show you the tool that I used to remove all of that rock. And I'm also going to point out this thing here. Because this thing is compressed. This was a thick skull. This is actually a pectoral or side fin, which was also armored. The, this is the underside, the mouth would have been there. But this would have been inflated, this would have been a thick fish skull, but it's been compressed by all of the weight of the years of sediment. And so if I'm working on that and you know, you're concentrating on getting rock off and sometimes you're not thinking about where you're putting your weight, your hand, and you could be damaging the rest of the fossil. So in this case, as it got thin, and I had already prepped the back side. This side was still encased in rock, so it was still supported. As I turned it over to move to the other side, I didn't want to break this thing, so I made a uh, mold of it so that if it did break, it's going to break in place, and then I can easily glue it back together. Plus, this little mold, and there's a certain way it fits in there, is a nice way to keep it safe when it's in storage. It's molded to the back side. So let's see how we would take care of much thicker rock uh, than would be appropriate for a, for a pin vise. And oh, before I go to that, here's one that's in progress. So this is a nodule of a lobe-finned fish. This was entirely covered in rock. And what I've done here is I've exposed the skull at this point. Uh, you can see the jaw. Uh, this is where the eye would have been, the, the maxilla here. And then these are actually scales that are exposed, but all of this has yet to be done. So the next tool that we're going to use is probably the most aggressive and the most dangerous in terms of potential for damming, damaging the specimen. And that's known as a pneumatic scribe. And, and there are different types of these. Some of them are larger for more aggressive rock removal. Some of them are much smaller and use much less air pressure. Uh, when you're dealing with very delicate fossils, but in all cases, you never touch the fossil with this. This is for removing rock near the fossil. 
In many cases, you get lucky and the fossil is not what we call sticky, such that as you begin to get near the fossil, the piece adhering to the fossil will just pop off without you ever touching it. But if you touch the fossil with this, you're going you're gonna to create little craters on it and it's not going to be good. But it basically is like a miniature jackhammer that works off of compressed air. So you've got a compressor and, and you set it to a certain pressure and you've got different tips that you can put on here and so you've got chisel-like tips and very fine tips and so on but this is for removing large amounts of matrix from a relatively hard rock okay after you've maybe done the pneumatic scribe and you've gotten as close to the fossil as you can without touching it and damaging it and there's still matrix attached to the fossil you may need to go to what we call air abrasion uh, where it's sort of like sandblasting except you're not using sand you want to find a medium that's harder than the rock but softer than the fossil so uh, you may be using something like dolomite powder that almost looks like talc I mean it is so fine but hard enough to hopefully remove the rock without damaging the fossil. Because in this case, what you're blasting will be touching the fossil. So you want to make sure that it isn't going to damage the fossil or change its luster and so on. And so, uh, and so I've got a cheap one because uh, I don't do a, a ton of this. They can be rather expensive. This one's actually a, a, what they're called an air eraser. It's not really made for fossil prep, but for my purposes it works. And so uh, let's take a look at uh, what that looks like in action. This is another tri this is a trilobite pygidium known as green ox booth eye. Look at the spines on the rear. That's about the butt end of a trilobite. Look at the spines being exposed. This one right? Yeah. Right there. So yeah, it's basically just all that fine adhering rock gets blown away without destroying the fossil. So another more unusual uh, method for prepping fossils is actually using chemicals. Um, in some cases uh, the rock will react to a chemical, chemical differently than the fossil. And what you hope is that the chemical that you use is going to dissolve the rock and not the fossil. If you have something that's made of calcium carbonate like a brachiopod shell or a clam shell and you try to dissolve away limestone with a strong acid, which the acid will do to the limestone, it's also going to destroy your fossil. But there are some instances where the, the rock reacts to a chemical differently than the fossil. In the case of vertebrate material like shark's teeth and shark um, denticles and, and uh, fish armor and that kind of thing, uh, those are composed of calcium phosphate and if you use a, a weak acid that's buffered so that it doesn't attack the calcium phosphate and only attacks the calcium carbonate, as in the case of limestone and so on, you can actually dissolve the rock without damaging or dissolving the fossil. Now it turns out that there are sometimes natural cracks in the teeth in the fossil such that when you throw the rock in a gallon or a five gallon bucket of acid, uh, yeah, it'll dissolve away the rock, won't dissolve the fossil, but the fossil breaks along those natural cleavages and then you get little puzzle pieces at the bottom of your bucket that you, you might have to try to put together although that would be hard but here you can see uh, just some bits and things this, so this came out of kind of a conglomerate that's that's glued together by calcium carbonate from a, a Permian deposit in Oklahoma and all these little bits in here are teeth and bone fragments and uh, and dermal denticles of fish, amphibians, sharks, and things like that. And uh, this is pretty much an old bucket and I'm done with it, but uh, it's a weak, a very weak buffered acid. And, and basically when it's done, the big chunks of rock that you put in there are gone. And then you've got sludge in the bottom and you slip that uh, sludge through sieve and what you're left with is things that aren't limestone like pebbles and things or silic uh, silicious class and hopefully fossils. So there's one other type of 
chemical prep that sort of uses the opposite in terms of pH, and that is uh, a, a strong base, and we'll, we'll take a look at that next. Okay, what we have here are fossils of freshwater clams, the same family of clam that we find, you know, the large mussels that you find around Michigan today, uh, called in the family Unionidae, and these actually come from the late Triassic period of New Mexico. I collected these in Quay County, New Mexico. So these are starting to get nice and clean. You can see the, the shell there and the shape of it. Okay, but when I started out, they're covered in rock, this red rock. And this red rock, uh, in my estimation, was likely rich in organic material. And if I can dissolve away the organic material, I can basically dissociate the rock and turn it into mud. And so you can't use acid on these shells because they're calcium carbonate, but I could attack the organic material that's, that's part of the matrix of the mudstone or shale or whatever that is, and maybe get it turned to mud so we can clean it off. And so, again, with any of these chemicals, you really, you know, here's the, the, the typical don't try this at home, uh, unless you're a professional, know what you're doing, and you have the right equipment. This is in a fume hood. I have an eye wash here. I've got an eye wash station there and a shower right next to me. Uh, if you get a piece of this chemical in your eye, you're in big trouble. So, but, you know, I wet it down to make sure that the material sticks in this case. And I apply the solid directly to the, to the rock and let it do its thing. And if there's organic material in there, uh, it should dissociate that rock. So normally I'm gonna have uh, gloves on to do this, but uh, I think I'm okay here. Here's some that I put on earlier today. It probably really hasn't set as long as it needs to. Usually I leave it on there for eight hours or so. But let's take this over to the sink and see if any of that rock is starting to melt off as a result of that strong base. Look at that. So a lot of that where you see all of this area here was covered in in that red siltstone. This is silicified or something. This isn't one going to want to come off as easy so I might have to use the scribe for that. And the stuff that isn't coming off, sort of this scale here, I think that's actually travertine. I think that was scale that formed, calcium carbonate scale that formed in the river when this shell was alive. So I think that's actually part of the fossil, not a part of the original shell, but part of the environment in which that shell lived in the late Triassic period. So just one other type of fossil prep that a scientist would use to get those beautiful museum quality specimens that you see on display in the major museums. All right, thank you very much, Tony, for uh, for having me here. My pleasure. Uh, we're going to turn off the camera and start another video about fossil identification. So uh, sign up for my channel and you can see that in the future. But for right now, if you want to see more fossils, uh, you can see a video where I went and found some at Rockport and Alpena. You've been to Rockport. Uh, awesome place, so uh, check that video out here.